Well, thank you to Steve Thecla and to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I have 15 minutes to give a very brief talk about oceans and human health, which I consider a wonderful topic. I'm a physician and epidemiologist, so I've just uh, interdisciplinary your meeting right there. What I want to do very quickly is talk about some of the oceans and human health work in the United States, and I do, see, do say algae. Um, and some new EU initiatives around that area. I'll touch on some of the major issues around uh, oceans and human health that have been done today, but I'd like to focus the end of my talk on some work we're doing in our center on um, the benefits of coastal living. Okay, so people have already given you the statistics. Why do we worry about oceans and human health? I think the real issue is, as humans, more and more of us are moving to coastal environments and more and more of us are getting lots of benefits from coastal environments, many of which you've already heard. I think one aspect that is particularly needs to be emphasized is the fact that this particularly, this has huge impact on developing nations. Trying to put some numbers around it, and again, you've heard some others, this is a U.S. Ocean Policy Commission report trying to divide it up into commercial and recreational benefits from coastal living and from the oceans. It's in the billions, and that's just for the U.S. If I want to date the Oceans and Human Health movement or discipline, I would date it from around the late 1990s when an, a wonderful book, it's very short, students love it, came out. I recommend it to everybody, but from the National Academy of Science called From Monsoons to Microbes. Since then, there's been a whole variety of other reports, um, too numerous to mention. And an exciting thing that's now finally happening in uh, Europe is that the um, Marine Board of the uh, European Science Foundation has gathered together a white paper group on oceans and human health. The white paper will be out this fall. It's been led by Mike Moore of um, PNL and our center. I think what the whole point of oceans and human health is to say there are wonderful benefits and there are risks from interacting with the environment. And these have health, these have impact on our health and well-being, and our behavior in turn has impact on our environment. And these are basically in a loop that these can all come back to haunt us both positively and negatively. So using monsoons to microbes just to organize it, in terms of risks, the 10-ton gorilla are probably extreme weather and climate change. I'm not going to touch on that very much. There are other people in, this, in the uh, symposium that will do that. Um, in terms of the oceans and human health work that's been done to date in the U.S., most of it has focused on harmful algal blooms and microbes and to a certain extent anthropogenic toxins. There is a whole nother area of benefits, some of which we just heard about, we'll hear more in this session and others. I want to spend the last part of my talk talking about the benefits of living in the coast. So the Oceans and Human Health community basically started in the U.S. because a number of uh, agencies funded several centers around the world, uh, around the United States. Um, I was the director of the one in Miami, there's one at Woods Hole, and you can see where the other ones are located, all terrible places to visit. What they did is they came up with very interdisciplinary centers. It brought biomedical and oceanographic scientists together to do research, to do training, to do um, create facilities, uh, shared culture facilities, for example, sharing a very expensive technology such as remote sensing, buoys, and particularly as an epidemiologist, I would like to point out, extremely expensive ship time, although very worthwhile. Some of the areas that they looked at were harmful algal blooms, you all know what harmful algal blooms are. Um, they're create, this is my favorite, personal favorite organism, Corinia brevis, and they can produce toxins, some of them that uh, can kill, as you know, uh, lots of different types of animals, and can affect us through our food chain and work that um, my research group did, for example, with Dan Baden and others. They also can affect us through respiratory exposures. Um, just to give you an idea of why harmful algal blooms are particularly relevant and their toxins in Europe, um, the recent EU working group on emerging toxins showed that ciguatoxin, ovatoxin, cyclic amines, and uh, tetrodotoxin are all appearing, and some of this is new as far as we know, in European waters. The other big area that we looked at was microbial disease, and this is things uh, such as viruses, you've just heard viruses, bacteria, parasites in the water. I love to think of it as poop in the water. Did a lot of research on that as well, and the people are, interact with it both recreationally and occupationally and again through the food chain. And just again, to make it more relevant, these are my walking pictures around uh, Cornwall, 
and there's a lot of poop, poop production in Cornwall. And not only is it the microbe overload, it also is the, the chemicals that we give to these animals, such as um, antibiotics and other, uh, hormone, other products. And then there's anthropogenic pollution. Basically anything that we um, create seems to end up at some point in the marine systems. And I would particularly draw attention to novel new compounds, such as the nanotechnology, which we are blithely going forth and creating, and a lot of it is ending up in our marine environment and it needs and is getting more attention. Traditionally, we focused on communities that ate, for example, were marine mammals, for example, Inuits in, uh, in Quebec province, and uh, Eric de Whaley's work on that, finding DDT in breast milk of Inuit mothers. But I think more and more what we're showing is that because of the food chain and other exposures, these anthropogenic chemicals come back to haunt all of us. And the last area that the marine centers have focused on, or the Oceans and Human Health Centers have focused on, has been a sort of good news story of how do we use remote sensing and modeling. This is an example from Florida where we have an annual Florida red, or a semi-annual Florida red tide. There's a lot of monitoring that goes on out there in the Gulf, but we also combined it with remote sensing. We combined it with real-time exposure assessment in uh, humans, and this is used by NOAA to create a harmful algal bloom bulletin to be used by uh, managers to try and manage these problems. The centers also got involved in the response to Hurricane Katrina. Um, basically, we showed that um, so the solution to pollution is dilution. And uh, more recently, the Gulf oil spill. So I think in the United States, the feeling has become that we now have a new scientific discipline, or at least a major area, again, of bringing biomedical and oceanographic scientists together. There's now Gordon Research Conferences. There are courses. There are textbooks, et cetera. And I think it's going to be really exciting in, as a new area here in the EU uh, and in the UK. So this says not so much fun listening to the ocean these days. So as part of blatant self-promotion, but also to move into a more positive topic, I want to talk now about the positive benefits that we're finding from living and interacting with the coasts. Our center, as was mentioned, is a, is a new center. It's funded by the EU. Over the past year and a half, we've hired 45 researchers, 18 PhD students, 16 master students. And when you hire American, you end up having Thanksgiving in Cornwall. But we also, one of the major foci of our research is to look at the interactions between health and well-being and the environment. So Mike DePlege, who's basically our center guru and who came up with the idea for this center, and William Byrd and others had come up with the idea of the blue gym. How, do we, how can we improve our health and well-being by interacting with coastal environments? What our center is trying to do is to take this sort of campaign, lovely idea, and apply rigorous research principles to it. And so um, this is primarily the work of Matt White, who is in the audience. He also has a poster, and um, he will correct me if I come out with anything wrong, but it's really exciting work that Matt and his research group are doing, including Mike DePlege and others. So what they're trying to do is test on all sorts of levels the hypothesis that if we interact with a blue environment, it somehow translates into physiologic and psychological and even social benefits. And so one paradigm is the sort of classic experimental paradigm. You stress somebody, you test their mood, you expose them to different uh, types of uh, uh, blue-green other space, and then you test them again. You can do this in the laboratory. You can do it in other types of laboratories. We have the wonderful National Marine Aquarium here. Um, also, you can even take it into dental surgeries around pain. So the first studies that Matt and his group did was around choosing a hotel room. So this is a hotel room, and it's the same hotel room, but here are different views. And what do most people pick? This one. Even in Uzbekistan, where they do not have ocean views, they pick this one. And they're willing to pay for it. So that's one issue. We value, and that's a, a theme that we've been hearing in this conference. Another issue is are, is, are there any data out there about health and, the coast, and coastal proximity? Well, if you survey people and ask them about their self-perceived benefits in terms of social, mental, or physical um, well-being, and you say in an urban, green, or blue environment, blue wins. Green's good, but blue's even better. And if you use the census data from England and look at a very strong measure of health that's been used, and it actually predicts mortality better than your GP, self-reported health, 
and you look at how far people live from the coast, the closer they are to the coast, the happier they are, the better their, their self-perceived health. And that's even if you take into account that they have lots of money. So we can, we can more or less do that out. And the part that's really interesting, which you may or may not be able to see in this slide, is this effect is strongest among communities that are deprived, not among the wealthiest, who presumably have lots of opportunities to get to the coast. Another thing that Matt and his group are looking at is who visits the coast. And using Natural England's monitoring engagement with the natural environment, uh, affectionately known as MENI, or MENI, <laughs> Uh, uh, survey, which is a very large survey that was done over two years of over 94,000 people, they found that in the last week, the last seven days in this survey, approximately 40% of the people reported having an engagement with nature. The majority of those were, uh, it, and this is in the UK, by the way, the majority of those obviously were in towns or countryside, but there were about 14% that were near the coasts. Of those, 70% of those coastal visits are from people who live within five miles of the coast. So opportunity and access are huge issues. Now, what can we say anything about stress reduction from coastal visits? Using a subset of the same data set, which asked a smaller group of people, do you, what, what experiences in nature give you an emotional experience? Which ones make you feel enjoy, or that you enjoyed, that you felt calmer, more relaxed, revitalized, refreshed? And again, you see the same trend. Blue wins out over green and definitely works out, wins out over urban. People value and remember those experiences. And even if you take out the dog walkers, the dog effect, you still see this. In fact, the effect is even stronger when you look at people who are, go to coastal areas or go to, go to nature, which do they value the most and which do they feel like gives them the most bang for their buck? Again, it's coastal areas more than green or urban. Questions that still need to be um, asked are, what are the optimal dose? How long do these effects last? How often do you need it? Um, does it is this true for all groups? And um, how does it play out with drugs? So for example, as a GP, could I prescribe um, a walk on a coastal path and maybe not give so much antidepressant? Or is it possible that it could be used, for example, for blood pressure? This is the incredible team that's been doing it at both the uh, European Center and the, in the uh, U uh, University of Exeter Medical School and also at Plymouth University. Um, I'd like to particularly point out Sabine Paul, who's uh, uh, Matt's close collaborator. And um, I think what his research and other people's, it's not just us, are showing is that people who live near coasts are healthier. And that's in the UK and developed countries. I think developing nations is a whole other issue that needs to be looked at because they're most at risk for climate change. But so far what our research is showing is they're more likely to visit the coast because they live near it, that these coastal visits, no matter who they are, are relaxing and stress reducing, that exercising, and this is some initial data that Matt can talk about, may be especially good, and that ocean sounds may be very important. But I think we have a lot more to learn. And I'd also like to draw our attention to the fact that we also have posters on trying to meld something, which I think uh, was mentioned earlier by Jackie McGlade, around how can we bring together a public health approach and ecosystem services approach? How can we make human health and well-being be incorporated into those, um, those assessments in, in terms of both protecting the environment and human health. Thank you very much.